you know the expression, timing is everything. Whatever is telling a joke, uh, making a dramatic entrance on a stage, or playing Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto Number no. 2, timing is essential if, one's to, if one wants to achieve success. Large corporations, for example, are, are doing extensive research to find what would be uh, the best moment to release um, a new product or to start a new initiative. They want to find the perfect timing for it. One example uh, would be how many movies do you think were released the same weekend than the latest Star Wars? Well, I look and I can tell you not that much. According to the box office, the most profitable new movie after Star Wars, uh, that specific weekend, was Alvin and the Chipmunks. With 20 times less uh, profit than The Force Awakens. Like I said, it's all about finding the right timing. I have said often to my congregation, and maybe you, uh, that the Gospel according to John is different from the three other ones in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke are called synoptics because they follow a similar chronology and present uh, Jesus' life in, uh, as a succession of events. One day Jesus does something, then he goes to another place, the next day he meets uh, some Pharisees, and so on and on. Well, the Gospel according to John is completely different. Like I said, in this text, timing is almost irrelevant. The narrative is not organized chronologically. Uh, one example would be the cleansing of the temple. In John, it happened in chapter 2 and not a few days before his crucifixion, like in the other three ones. Uh, no, instead of telling uh, the life of Jesus from a chronology, uh, chron chronologically point of view, the Ford Gospel preferred to focus on symbolism in its presentation of the good news. The only goal of the author is, as it is written at the end of the Gospel, that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in His name. So, in today's passage, at an unspecified time, Jesus attended a wedding with His mother and some disciples. We are not told our Jesus, how old Jesus is, but personally, I suspect that he's still a teenager. You see, when Mary tell his son, tell her son, sorry, when Mary tell her son that the wine ran out too uh, early, which is always a catastrophe regardless of the wedding, I. I could share uh, some horrible stories about times when this happened, but that's not the topic of my sermon, so I will focus a little more. So, when Mary tells his son that there's no more wine, Jesus' answer is something like, this, yeah, pfft, yeah, yeah, which was beautifully translated in our Bible as, women, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not come yet, is, what should I care for that? Makes me think he's a teenager. This, this exchange between Mary and Jesus sounds very similar to any parents who ask their 14 years old to clean up their room before a family or, or, or friends coming, and they have this answer of, oh, not now, mom, I don't feel like doing it, I'll do it later, my hour has not come yet. Humor aside, maybe, maybe Jesus' initial, ref, initial refusal is not based on laziness. 
Maybe some would say the wedding in Cana was not the time nor the place to perform a miracle or some amazing deeds. You see, for the author of the fourth gospel, Jesus is nothing less than the Messiah, the Christ, who had come to change everything, to reinterpret scripture for the people of God and to manifest God's majesty to the world. The glory of the Word made flesh is ultimately revealed through his, his passion, crucifixion, and resurrection. And Jesus' curious reluctance to act following his mother's statement that the wine had run out might be understandable. Some would say, did Jesus really have time to waste on such trivial matters? Should it be more useful for him to focus on, I don't know, more divine issues? Maybe it was, maybe it was true that his hour has not came yet. Or as it? My why, my hour has not came yet. I'm not ready for this. I have enough on my plate right now. I don't have time for this. How many times have we said similar words? On how many occasions have we invoked a lack of time from refraining from doing something? Many of us like the idea of being involved in our world, to, to join a great enterprise, and or sharing our gifts with those who are less fortunate, those who have less. However, most often we like to do it on our own time. We want to prepare ourselves before beginning a new project. We prefer to think about it first. We, we might look for a good book or a workshop to deepen our understanding of the issue. We desire to put all our dots in our eyes and cross all our T's before taking action. Not that there's anything wrong with this, nothing wrong. But sometimes life does not follow the strategies we plan. Demands come to us. Challenges knock at our door. New appeal emerge just, just in front of us. Unforeseen events force us to change our beautiful plan and, and prefer timing. As it seems to be the case often in Jesus' ministry, the needs of the people in front of us, all around us, send our own hour or preferred timing to the back seat. And our understanding of our own hour is also disturbed by people like Mary. Regardless of the possibility she was related or not to the wedding party, Mary saw a problem and she decided to act upon it. First, she goes to Jesus because she believes he was able to do something to improve the situation. She tells him, do something, my son, now. And then she goes to the servants and tells them, do whatever he tells you. Mary, like others in her world, is not the kind of individual who sit back and remain inactive in front of a problem. She does not wait for the situation to be, to be solved by itself. She's attentive to her surrounding and somehow she finds ways to, to bring people and, and to pull people uh, into, into the project regardless of their initial reaction. She's convinced that the right time to be involved is now. And we know the rest of today's story. Jesus instructs the servants to fill six large stone jar of water to grow some of that water, now turn into wine, and take it to the chief steward. The new wine was even better than the original one. The wedding and the honor of everyone were safe. But interestingly, besides the servant, nobody seems to know that Jesus saved the day. 
Only a few witness this extraordinary deed and believe in Jesus. It seems to be a lot of effort for little result. It, it would have been easy for Jesus to, to stand up and said, hello, hello everyone, look at me. I'm the one who brought you all this extra wine. Me, your Messiah. Oh man, don't tell me I waste one of my miracles for nothing. Can you at least show me some consideration? Yes, it would have been easy. But that's not what Jesus did. He didn't do it because this miracle was not done for his glory, for his convenience, for his popularity. This miracle was done to respond to human needs. In our congregation, in our personal lives, we're constantly called to take action, to react to unforeseen events. We're told that we're told in many ways we can make a difference in our work. And <coughs> sorry, on some occasion, yes, the project seems to be huge and it feels almost impossible, like turning water into wine. But most of the time, we're invited to do simple things, simple deeds. Very easy, like, like giving a hug that convey unbounded love. Making a small donation of food or money that can make the difference between uh, abundance and scarcity. Or, or just sharing a smile at the right time to the right individual. And all of this, all of this make a huge difference. And all of this can make a huge difference and all of this is possible when we accept to let go. When we are open to rearrange our plan. When we are prepared to maybe set our preferred timing to the back seat when we are ready to discover how the reign of God can break in through ordinary and mundane moments of our lives. Like I said a few minutes ago, timing is everything. Whether it's telling a joke, making a dramatic entrance, or revealing God's glory to the world, one has to find the perfect timing. In Cana, the realm of God became a reality, not in an hour of exuberant triumph and spectacular side effect and massive conversion, but it happened to a moment that was triggered by a human need. And maybe Jesus was not ready to begin his public ministry, I don't know. Maybe he had a few more things to figure it out. Nevertheless, there was a need in front of him, and he seized this opportunity. He helped people. He helped those who were just in front of, of him, and he reached them where they were. And he was also reminded by his mother that it was the right time to act. And for us, as we're reading this story today, we are reminded that whatever we think our hour or perfect timing might be, we're always in what we can call God's time. God's time that show us the possibility in front of us, the needs in front of us, and we are invited to act because during God's time, Everything is possible. Amen.